Rescue a temp of a Lake Lure couple stranded on a cliff. We now know what happened to the husband. He was left behind after the volunteer chopper pilot who saved his wife was forced to end that rescue effort under the threat of arrest by a Lake Lure fire official. Here's Queen City News Chief Investigator Jody Barr. I was able to look him up a few minutes after I left. And who is this? His title online is the assistant chief of Lake Lure Fire and Rescue. This is the man volunteer helicopter pilot Jordan Sidum said threatened to arrest him if he made one more trip up a Lake Lure mountain to rescue another person. Just minutes before, a couple waved Sidum down as he passed overhead. Mike and Susan Coffey were stranded on a cliff after the storm washed away their home in the land it sat on. We could see the water starting to get much more um, violent, right? And we could see trees start to go down and the water levels start to rise, but we kind of thought we were safe because we were so high up. And then we started to hear a lot of noises. Rumbling. Know, just rumbling. It wasn't thunder. What's this weird rumbling? Yeah. Which, tre trees which, falling, right. rocks, you know, so it got a little bit frightening at that point. We actually sat there and then we watched our house go. The, the cliff just dropped uh, that whole side of the road. The, the cliff just dropped off, right? All of the trees and the dirt and everything else just started collapsing. For the next two and a half days, the couple slept in their car, surviving on two bottles of water and two bags of chips. Friday night, I mean, we had yeah. the water, we had potato chips, we're also dehydrating. Like, well, that was a great pick, you know? Um, but so by the next morning, we were starting to get worried again of what we would have to be able to drink. We started to see helicopters go over. So every time we heard a copter, we'd just run out and start waving. There was a big pile of rocks at the house next door. So we did a big SOS sign in the cul-de-sac with the rocks and um, just staying in the moment to stay positive and not worry too much. And then we saw this small black helicopter fly and we were waving at it and it stopped. And, and it, it actually stopped. Well, yeah, it circled over us. When you saw that helicopter make a U-turn, and start coming toward you. What what was going through your mind at that moment? Thank God. Thank God somebody saw us. Somebody was trying to help somewhere. So that was the first time somebody actually stopped and acknowledged that we were there. And so Mike says, of course, for me to go first, he'll stay there with the cat. And then Jordan says, I'll come back and get you. Sidum left his son with Mike Coffee and flew Susan to what Sidum described as a command post three minutes away near Lake Lure. So we land and I, I get out of the helicopter and I go towards them. And so then Jordan is able to come out and they're just standing there looking very mad and very annoyed. And so who are you? You know, I, and I didn't realize he had just taken it upon himself followed his heart to come help rescue people. And, um, and this communication is so down, it's hard to know who to let know that he has this free airspace that he can go do this. So he was telling them who he was and what he was doing. And they just were just not happy. They weren't happy about it. And um, they, yeah, he said, this is our like, this is our mission. This is our operation. We can't just have you flying in and out. Uh, and so he was trying to tell them, Jordan was, telling them, well, I can't just leave her husband. There. I, don't want, I don't want to separate a family. So if you just let me go back and get her husband and then I'll bring him here and then I'll take my son and we'll we'll go. One of the Michigan firemen, Sidum says he spoke to and who gave him radio frequencies to help coordinate with them, told him to do whatever he had to. Susan Coffey witnessed that conversation. Pretty much told him in a way, break the rule, just go get her, go get the husband so that they can be reunited. Um, so that's why I thought that it was okay that he was going to be able to go get him. I didn't know that then he was threatened with arrest. He was told just to leave. And, um, so I thought he was going to go get my husband and, um, he yeah. informed me when he got there and when I got to the door, <clears throat> he said, I am so sorry, but I'm told if I bring you back, that I'm gonna be arrested and I can't take you back with me. And in fact, I was told I couldn't come get my co-pilot, my son. I just told him I'm not gonna leave my son here. He said, I am so sorry, I don't know what to tell you, but I need to take my son and we're gonna leave. 
and they've told me they're aware of what, where you are and you will be rescued. He takes off. I had no idea where my wife was. I couldn't comprehend what was going on. Like, how did this make sense? And when, if ever, I was gonna be reunited with her, how long it would take for some other rescue crew to get back to me. So that was the most stressful part of the whole experience. I can watch my house go. I can watch our neighbor's houses go. We were together, right? And and we knew each other was safe. Um, and when he left, that thought, right, just kind of disappeared. Like, okay, I don't know what's gonna happen from here. Coffee hiked down the cliff and found what he believes is that same Michigan rescue crew from the command post. Probably 20, 25 minutes later, I saw a rescue crew across the river and I was waving them down and I was able to get down the banks to our side of the river where I could at least yell and communicate across the river saying, do you have my wife? Do you know where my wife is? Um, <clears throat> and they were giving me the thumbs up. They used ropes to drag him across the raging debris-filled river to safety. And the very first thing he said to me was, are you okay? Are you my coffee? We've got your wife, so she's safe. So at that point, <laughs> I could relax, you know, um, knowing that she was safe. You know, those guys also, they came down from Michigan. They don't know us from anybody. Um, they were willing to put their lives on the line. You know, they're they're also heroes in the story. Was there a point in time when either of you thought maybe uh, you may not see one another again? Of course. I certainly did. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He didn't know who took me in at that point. And... I mean, honestly, you know, this guy shows up in a helicopter, he takes your wife, and then he comes back and says, oh, I can't pick you up, right? I had no idea. When things if, go through your mind, you know, right? I was going to see her again, where she was taken. After a few hours, the coffees found one another again. So when the bus came back to get me, and then I, I see the doors open and Mike's head sticks out. Her. And he's like, Susan, Mike, Mike. <laughs> oh my God. I was so relieved that, um, <laughs> that he was picked up and that we were back together. In the days after the storm, the communication lines were down at Town Hall. No phone, internet, or cell signal either. We sent messages to Assistant Chief Chris Melton. The man Jordan Sidum said ran him and any other pilot who showed up out of town under threat of arrest. But Melton never responded. Thursday morning, instead of making Assistant Chief Melton available, the town offered its town manager for an interview. So the personal aircraft that landed was um, not only unauthorized, but also they provided no notification that they were um, coming. And that did pose a potential risk to ongoing operations with search and rescue. And then, um, you know, also just wasn't safe for them to be there as regular citizens, um, especially since we didn't know, you know, who they were or what, what they were doing there. In the days after the storm, through that Sunday morning, there was no restricted airspace uh, in Lake mm -hmm. Lure. The FAA did impose a temporary flight restriction after this uh, encounter between Mr. Sidum and the Assistant Fire Chief Melton. Um, so you all still contend today that no one should have been in that area trying to save these people who had been stranded for uh, two days headed headed into day two, possibly next to day three. Correct. If anything, they should have um, at least notified Incident Command who would have authorized them or not authorized them to be in that area. Sidham said he did exactly that. When he landed at the Rutherford County Airport and spoke with the people in charge, Sidham says airport officials told him they were only selling fuel to private aircraft if those pilots were helping in the search and rescue effort. Sidham has the receipts showing a fuel purchase going into Lake Lure that Sunday morning and one after the arrest threat just two hours later. And that I'm is unaware of unaware of that. Uh, Ms. Stuman, less than 24 hours later, private pilots were being asked to return to that area to do what Mr. Sidhum was doing at that time. Do you see how that the public may look at that and go, well, that's uh, that's a little perplexing that, you know, just before he was in severely endangering rescue efforts and then, you know, less than a day later, they're being begged to come back and help. Well, I can only imagine that they went through the correct 
chain of command to be authorized to come here. What was the danger posed in what Mr. Sidhoon did, the specific danger that day? Well, it interrupted operations of the people who were there from national, state, and local resources, one, and um, two, you know, downtown Chimney Rock is in disarray right now. Um, for for someone who's not trained, not adequately adequately trained in emergency operations, um, you know, especially at that time, they should not have been in that location. Well, just some hours later, he was back in the area and the county welcomed him in to do exactly what he did just the day before. Do you think his training was significantly improved overnight? I think that it's not that we're turning away help or volunteerism at all. Once again, we just need to go through the right steps to do that. Um, so, so we're aware, the state is aware, Rutherford County is aware, and the town of Lake Lore and village of Chimney Rock is aware of what's going on. That was not the case initially. Are you all welcoming those private helicopter pilots who have delivered food and water and medical supplies and are, are helping rescue human lives from the mountains around Lake Lore? Are you guys welcoming, welcoming them now? That would need to go through the Rutherford County Emergency Management or the state emergency management. I'm asking you as a, an official, the leader of uh, Lake Lure, North Carolina, are you now welcoming those private helicopters uh, in your community? Yes, if they go through the necessary channels. Do you think that your people on the ground in Lake Lure uh, did what they should have done when they handled this flooding victim that was delivered to them in the encounter between Assistant Chief Melton and this private pilot? Yes, sir. Sir, they were doing what they um we're supposed to do at that time. And, you know, I, I can't speak highly enough of Mr. Melton and all of our emergency personnel that's here right now. They've been out here for days on end, putting their lives on the line to save people. And, um, you know, they were doing their job. What would you say to him today? I would ask that why he didn't take the time to assess the whole situation and, and make a better decision. As an emergency manager, director, and assistant chief of the fire department, that's the time that you should trying to be coordinating with outside agencies to get more help in. That's your job title, and there wasn't much coordination going on. Sidhoon told us the only thing he regrets is leaving Mike Coffey behind, and whatever price he had to pay, he should have paid it. I'm sorry. If I had to do it over again, I, I would have stopped, and I would have rescued as many people in, until they decided they were going to arrest me. He got my wife at his own cost, at a risk to himself, and he was the one person who actually stopped to help just because he could, right? I mean, he got in his helicopter and flew up there just because he knew he could make a difference to someone, uh, and he did. He's a hero, yeah. I'm sure everyone's stressed in that scenario, but he was following his heart and doing the right thing. Maybe there were rules that somebody would like to impose order on the chaos, but at the bottom line is, getting those people out of there. Um, and even if I had never been rescued, knowing that she was safe because he, what he did would have been enough. So thank you, Jordan. Thank you. Less than 24 hours after we interviewed Jordan Sidham, he was invited back into the disaster area, along with dozens of other private chopper pilots. A massive all-volunteer supply and rescue effort is working out of the Hickory Airport, doing flight rescues and delivering supplies to places where military helicopters are just too big to get into. The latest numbers we have show those volunteer pilots have rescued somewhere around 200 people and have delivered several tons of food, water, and medical supplies to